is Joshua addressing the children of Israel right before he died. And um, this is kind of his fatherly speech to the nation. He was the leader. He led them over the Jordan River and into the Promised Land. And through the, uh, the leadership of Joshua as the general, so to speak, of Israel, they were able to conquer many of the, of the enemies that were there. And, you know, all of us have choices that we have to make in our life. And Joshua understood that the children of Israel, now that they were at a place of peace in their life, had a lot of choices that they were going to have to make. No doubt the Sellers family is going to have a lot of choices to make in the days to come. You know, what color is the carpet going to be and what's the design of the house going to look like? But the most important choice that you'll make in your life is not the type of car that you're going to buy next. It's not the place that you're going to move. It's not going to be your next job or your next career advancement. The most important choice that you will ever make in your life has eternal significance, and that is whether or not you repent of your sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and follow God with all of your heart. I mean, that's the bottom line. This week, a a family in our church narrowly avoided death. And anytime you have a brush with death, it really makes us think about the most important things in our lives. And I'd like us to go ahead and just read a couple of verses here in Joshua 24. Then we'll pray and we'll get into God's word in the time that we have left this morning. Joshua 24 verse number 1 says, And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, all right, all of Israel gathered together. Joshua is preaching to the entire nation. He says, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old times, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. Let's pray together and then we'll get into God's word. Father, I ask you right now that your spirit, Lord, would show us exactly what you want us to know from your word. Open our eyes, Lord, I pray that we would behold wonderful things out of your law. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, if you know from Sunday school growing up, the book of Joshua is all about conquest. Um, Jericho, the walls came a-tumbling down. There's a song that we taught our children, and Joshua took the children of Israel and marched around Jericho six times, and in a miraculous way on the seventh time, the walls came tumbling down. There was the battle of Ai, and all the kings of, of the land were defeated. And then chapter after chapter in the book of Joshua is the allotment of different lands to the tribes. And if you read through your Bible in a year, this is often the part that we kind of put it on cruise control and kind of fast forward through because there's just a lot of details, minutia here in this book. But I love how it talks about the conquest that they had in the promised land. And then when you get to chapter 23, if you have your Bible, look at chapter 23 in verse number one. The Bible says, after all of the battles, and it came to pass a long time after that the Lord had given them rest unto Israel from all of their enemies round about, that Joshua waxed old and was stricken in age. So finally, Israel got to a point where they had rest in their lives. I don't know, sellers, when you guys are going to have rest again. I know it's been off and on throughout the past couple of days, sleep is here and there. And, you know, you go through something like this, it's going to be a while until the house is rebuilt, until you can move into something. And that's probably a little bit how Israel felt. Finally, they were at peace. Finally, everybody had a place that they could call home. They had their own land, and they could begin to settle down and make a life for themselves. And so Joshua is about to die. And so he gathers all the people together for basically a revival service. But this was before the days of Billy Graham, okay? This was all of Israel coming together and hearing from their leader one more time before he dies. And in verse number 2 of chapter 24, Joshua reminds them of their history. By the way, it's often a good thing for you to go back in your life and remember what God has done. Because when you look back at your life and you see how the, your st- the steps that you have taken have been orchestrated by God, you look and you back and you say, there's no way I could be here today if it wasn't for God. He says, remember Father Abraham. Maybe they started to sing that song, Father Abraham and many sons, I don't know. But he says, remember Moses and remember Aaron. Remember when you entered into Canaan, I, I spread the Jordan River for you. You remember Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the Exodus, the plagues of Egypt. God brought you to this place. And I believe with all of my heart that's the seller's attitude as well. God brought me to this place in my life. Hey, wherever, you, wherever you're from, wherever you were born, I was born in, in New Orleans and moved to New Hampshire and then to Arizona and I ended up in Northern Virginia. I don't know what your story is, but wherever you're from, I could say this with certainty this morning, 
There is a reason that you are here today. God, back when time, before time began, wrote in his book of life, and he orchestrated every moment of your life, and he ordained it that you would be here, right here, right now, today. And so I would say to you the same thing that Joshua said to the children of Israel. God brought you here. Sellers family, this didn't take God by surprise. He, he knew exactly what he was doing when he allowed your house to catch on fire. And so here's the challenge that Joshua gives to the people. He says, I want you to fear God, and I want you to serve him. Look at verse number 15. Joshua says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. Listen, you go to the Christian bookstore in Sterling, and you can find paintings that have that verse on it. You can find plaques. You can find cups, ceramic cups that have that phrase on it. As for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. And we love that phrase. But Joshua is giving the children of Israel just one opportunity here. He's saying, you cannot re remain neutral on this one. You have to decide right here, right now, today, who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve the gods on the other side of the flood? Are you going to serve the gods on the other side of the Jordan River? Or are you going to serve the gods of the, Bi the God of the Bible? Verse number 15, as for me and for my house, Joshua says, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, we love that verse. Our family, under our roof, under our tent, we're going to serve God. Hey, look, if you're looking for the people who love the Lord, count me, Joshua's saying, my hand is up. If you're going to take a survey of the land of Israel and see who's serving Jehovah, count my family in. And there was conviction about truth. There was the reality of the one true God. Martin Luther, in his Dia de Worms, he said this, I cannot, I will not recant. Eric Little, when he was um, when, right before the Olympics, you know that movie Chariots of Fiver, Fire? He said in his Scottish brogue, I will not run. They had conviction. Peter and John stood before the Sanhedrin and before the Jewish council there in Acts chapter number 4. And they were accusing Peter and John of blasphemy. And John, Peter rather looked into the face of the people and he said, There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must be saved. And the Bible says that when they saw that Peter and John were fishermen, but they were so eloquent in their speech and so convincing, they noted that they had been with Jesus. Faithway family, can I say this this morning? You have to choose who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve the God of the Bible, or are you going to serve the gods of this world? Now, most of you probably don't have idols in your home that you go down and bow down to every single day. But can I be honest? All of us have idols in our lives, things that we put before God. As Robert mentioned, you know, sometimes even their home had become an idol to them. They had allowed their home to take priority in their life rather than the place that God deserved to be. And you look at the response of the people in verse number 16. Look, if you have your Bible, look at verse number 16. The people answer Joshua, a response to the challenge. God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And, and which did great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went. And among all the people through whom we passed. And you look at the response of the people. And you would think that Joshua would say, right on, you know, you're going to serve God, that's great. But that's not what Joshua said. Look at verse 19, Joshua said unto the people, you cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is je a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions, nor your sins. Joshua says, you can't serve God, it's impossible. So why would he say that? Well, look at the people responded in verse number 21. And the people said unto Joshua, nay, or no, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua gives a plea to them, a stirring plea, choose who you're going to serve. And the people say, Joshua, we're going to serve the Lord. And Joshua says, I don't think you're going to serve him. You see, Joshua is trying to drive home two points that I want everyone here this morning to get. Whether your house was burned down this past week, or whether you have so much in your life that you just don't know what to do with it. If you're overflowing with the blessings of God, or you have nothing... I want you to understand these two things this morning. God requires single-mindedness, and he requires seriousness. People oftentimes will say, we will serve God. And rather than Joshua saying, well, that's wonderful. I'm glad you want to serve the Lord. 
here's the sign-up sheet for the nursery, you know, we need you to serve the Lord. Here's the sign-up sheet for cleaning the church building, we'll put you to work. No, instead of that, Joshua challenges them and he says, no, you're not going to be able to do that. See, they knew the right answer. In fact, if you look at your Bible and you compare it to what Joshua said earlier, they almost parroted the same thing that Joshua said to them, or said to them, back to him. Joshua knew that they, they, they understood what they were supposed to say. Of course, Joshua, we're Jews, we're Israelites. We don't follow those false gods. So why does Joshua rebuke them in verse number 19? Answer, because he senses that they are not single-minded in their devotion. You see, Joshua was not looking for a half-hearted response. He didn't want God to get half of the things in their life. God wanted all of their heart. And many of us here today, we know the right answers. We know the things that we're supposed to say when we're challenged, but do we really mean it? And the challenge is hard for us in our own lives. What is Joshua speaking to? Who is he speaking to? It, it's not a group of heathen people per se, right? It's not like God said, go out and get all the Jebusites and the Hittites and the mosquito bites and all the other ites that are out there. That's not what God's saying. He's speaking to a group of single-minded Jews who want to serve God. These are God's people. These are the church members. But Joshua isn't certain that they are single-minded in their life. Look, everyone here hearing the story of Robert, their testimony today, you have to make a choice. If TV is God, then serve TV on Sunday morning. If sports is God, then serve sports. If career is God or money is God, then go, and go ahead and serve your career. Why? Because you cannot serve two masters. It's impossible. Joshua says, how long will you halt? How long will you waver between two opinions? If God is God, then serve God. If Baal is God, the false gods of the world are God, then serve those false gods. He wants your commitment to be serious. And listen, if you say this morning, if you count the ones who love the Lord, count me and my family. If that's your commitment this morning, then God wants you to put away your idols. Joshua, it's a, as if he draws up a contract and he didn't say as long as you're spiritual, that's great. No, he said, I want you to decide, to decide right here, right now that you're going to follow Jesus Christ. Why is it so often that we work hard at school? We work hard at work. We work hard at fixing up our home. But as soon as it gets around to being in church and as soon as following God gets hard, then no longer do we want to follow him. Why is that? I don't understand. And, and that's exactly what Joshua is saying. Look at verse number 24. Joshua says, and the people said unto Joshua, rather, the Lord our God will we serve and his voice will we obey. Listen, it's not enough this morning to say, yeah, that's our God. We're on team Jesus. Chapter, or chapter 23, God had given them the rest that they needed in the land. Finally, they were there. Fellers, a year from now, when you're able to move into your house, you'll finally have rest once again. And that's how Israel felt. They had rest. Maybe they had bills to pay. Maybe they had kids in soccer or band practice. Maybe they had to figure out a way in their busy day to get their oil changed and to get the groceries. Maybe they had to take their kids to the doctor and fight with insurance to try to figure out how to get the thing paid. I, I don't know what they had going on in their life. But it's often that when we are at rest, God tests our devotion for single-mindedness. God says, be strong and be careful to obey all the commandments that I give you. Why? Why be strong? Because when you are at rest, because when you're going through your pattern and your routine, it's so easy for us to get complacent. Oftentimes, the choice that matters most is, that, uh, is actually a lifetime of choices. You know, maybe you're here today and you say, I've never made a decision to follow Jesus as my Savior. There's never been a time in my life when I've repented of my sin and put my faith and trust in Him. You know, the song we sang just a few moments ago as we dismissed the children go, went, For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son to die on Calvary's tree from sin to set you free. The greatest problem that you have here today is not a lack of money. It, it's not the bills that need to be paid. The greatest problem that you have is not a relationship issue or a financial issue. The greatest problem that you have in your life is a sin issue. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse number 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You and I, we've broken the law of God. There, there's been times in our life where we've lied and we've stolen and we've cheated. And you may say, well, that's not that big of a deal, right? It's just a few minor sins. No, the Bible says if you break one sin, you're guilty of them all. 
Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The wages, the consequences of our sin is death. You know, there's, there's that old saying that goes, you know, close only counts in horseshoes and what? Hand grenades, right? And you may think that you are close to getting saved. You may think that you are close to Jesus Christ, but close does not count in Christianity. There was a man who came up to Jesus one time and he said, Lord, I've obeyed all the commandments. And, and really he hadn't, but he thought in his own mind that he did. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, you are close to the kingdom of heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, wouldn't it be a shame one day if you were to stand before God when you pass away and you look at him in the face and he says to you, I tell you the truth, you were so close. You were at church on February 8th, 2015, and you had an opportunity to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You, you were so close, your parents taught you. You grew up in church. You were not far from the, king, from the kingdom of God, but beloved, close is not enough. Joshua says to the people, and, and God says to us here today, if you truly want to follow God, it requires a serious and a single-minded devotion could you imagine there's a dad sitting here today and he, he says to his son son are you going to serve me and, and and of course dad dad I, i'm here i'm going to serve you i'm going to help you no 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 no, son i want you to look at me when i'm talking to you right and, and put the iphone down let's have eye to eye contact here son are you going to serve me yes dad i'm going to serve you you sure yeah okay then if you're going to serve me it has to go all the way and that's exactly what God says to us here today. Look, you can say I want to do right. You can say I want to make changes in my life. But friend, the only way that you're ever going to be able to make a permanent change in your life is to put Jesus Christ on the throne of your heart. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If you grew up in church, no doubt you've heard about the Apostle Paul. He, he wrote a good chunk of the New Testament, the latter part of my Bible here. And, and the Apostle Paul was a very famous Christian. A lot of churches have been named after him. He was a great preacher of the word of God. But before he got saved, he was probably more well known in the Jewish circles. He was the, the Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was very eloquent. He was very smart. He trained under the best teachers of his day. He was right up there, the best scholar that Israel had produced in a long time. And yet when he met Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, or Paul said, rather, he counted all but dung. He says it's all worthless for Christ. You might serve God with single-mindedness and, and, and God will be pleased. But friend, you might think that serving him with single-mindedness means you need to work harder. No, it's not about working harder. It's about believing stronger. It's about believing that God is better and that God is stronger and that God has a great plan for your life, much greater than you could ever orchestrate. You see, you could go out like the sellers and you could buy your dream home and you could move into something and say, this is it, I worked so hard for this and I love this. And God could say to you in one moment, he could take it all away. But do you have faith to believe that Jesus' words to his disciples were true? That whatever you give up in this life to follow Jesus, he will repay you 10 times, 30 times, even 100 fold and the life that is to come. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to leave you with the, the words of Joshua here in this passage of scripture where Joshua said, choose you today whom ye will serve. Who are you going to serve this morning? If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if he's never saved you from your sins, you can't serve him until you first believe. John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life ladies and gentlemen who are you going to serve today as for me and for my house we're going to serve the Lord and my prayer one day brother Robert is that we'll be able to dedicate your home to the Lord and hopefully we don't have to do an exorcism hopefully we'll start from the beginning and say Lord this house belongs to you from scratch, we'll start over and we'll say, Lord, we're building this house for you. And if that's the seller's prayer this morning, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. I wonder if that's your prayer as well. I wonder if today on February 8th, 2015, you say, you know, it's time for me to hit that reset button in my Christian life. 
I've been living my life however I want to live it. I, I've been living it for the pleasures of this world. I've been not literally bowing down to idols, but I've been putting my house and my job and my career and my kid and all of those things in front of God, and it's about time for him to be priority number one in my life again. Today I want to rededicate my life to the Lord, and I want to serve him with all of my heart. In just a moment, we're going to pray, and I'm going to give you an opportunity in the quietness of the moment to do that, to take care of business with the Lord. As for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. All week as I've been thinking about the events that have been going on, and I've been thinking about what I would say this morning, my prayer has been that you and your family would choose to serve the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for preserving the sellers this week and keeping them safe. Lord, from harm physically, you, you protected them. And Lord, we're thankful for that. But Father, you tell us in your word that it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. And we will all stand before you one day, Lord. And I pray that when we stand before you, we'll be able to hear you say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of my Lord. But Lord, there may be someone here today who's never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They've never been saved from their sins. And I pray today, Lord, that they would call out to you and ask you to save them. Our heads are bowed this morning. Our eyes are closed. George is going to play on the piano softly. Can I just ask you, do you know for sure if you were to die today that you would go to heaven if that had been your house on fire and you had slept through the smoke alarm if that had been your last night here on earth and you entered into eternity and stood before God and God said to you why should I let you into heaven what would you say would you say Lord I've been a good person close may count in horseshoes but close doesn't count in Christianity is Jesus Christ your savior have you ever repented of your sins and asked him to save you if not right here right now where you're seated would you cry out to the Lord and ask him to save you a prayer between your heart and heaven pray something like this Lord Jesus I know that I'm a sinner I know that I deserve the judgment of God in hell. But I also know that you paid the price for my sin. And you died on the cross. You said, sent your son to die for my sins. And the best that I know how, I'm calling unto you and asking you to save me from my sins. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior before, but right here today, that was a prayer between your heart and heaven. Listen, everyone has their heads bowed and eyes closed, but I wonder, is there anyone today who would just simply raise their hand and say, Pastor, please pray for me. I made that decision today. I made that decision to follow Jesus. Is there anyone like that today? Pastor, please pray for me. I won't embarrass you. I won't call you out. I've made a decision today to follow Christ. Amen. Amen. Anybody else today? Praise the Lord. Anybody else? I have decided to follow Jesus. Anybody else today? Christian, is your house God's house? Can you say this morning, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord? I wonder how many of you this morning would say, Pastor, please pray for our family. Today, we're rededicating our house to the Lord. And we're going to serve God in our house. And we're not going to live for the idols of this flesh or the world any longer. But we're going to have single-mindedness and single devotion to the Lord. Anyone else like that today? Pastor, pray for our family. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? I'll pray for you. Anyone else I can pray for today? Praise the Lord. Thank you, guys. Great. Let's pray together. Father, there are so many people today that have made decisions for you. And you allow opportunities like this in our lives to refocus and recenter our priorities on what the most important thing is, and that is you. I pray that we would take time now, Lord, to spend in your presence, making these decisions in our family and in our home. In Jesus' name.
If God spoke into your heart this morning, I'd like to give you an opportunity right here, just with your heads bowed, your eyes closed. Talk to God. Tell him the decision that you made and ask him to give you the strength to live it out in your life. Would you do that? Thank you.